Hello, Rep. Hi. Happy Monday. Hello, Francis. Happy Monday. Good to see you. Nice to see you. I see your quarantine chic is improving. <laughs> it's recursive. I don't know if it's progressive. <laughs> there you go. Very is that recursive a philosophical way of saying <laughs> curly? Very curly. Exactly. So thanks for agreeing to do this. Uh I um uh, this is like the treat in my week to schedule time to discuss something not related to work. Um, and uh, the, um, my idea for this series is that the uh, art of Socratic dialogue or inquiry could be revitalized and, and it was actually somehow useful in examining our core beliefs. Uh, but when I ask people, uh, what's something that you believe that you're willing to be questioned on very, very few people like have an answer. Um, in, in Zohar style, uh, <laughs> you say, you, you give me a paradox. So you're willing to be questioned on a paradox. And the, uh, the statement, you, the belief that you're willing to um, defend is uh, that wisdom is both ubiquitous and rare. Um, Seems safe. Uh, yep. And I was discussing this um, with... Uh, uh, I was assessing this with my girlfriend who has debate, she was in debate in, in, in college, I was in debate in high school, and I was thinking that uh, in the rules of debate, um, <laughs> normally the negative, the negative position can attack from any angle and doesn't have to be consistent, but the affirmative position has to be consistent. But by, uh, <laughs> by taking, an, by, with the, when the affirmative assumes a paradox, then the negative has to um, commit to one, basically saying it's not paradoxical, it's just X. It's not X and Y, it's just X or it's just Y. And so you've weirdly totally reversed it and now put me in the position, put me in the position of having uh, an opinion, um, uh, which is very sneaky of you. Uh, but uh, I didn't even know I was being sneaky, but I, I did have the thought that um, these these kinds of statements are um, they're like religious in a way. So if you believe them, then they mean a lot. But then if you're skeptical or scientific, they're kind of nonsensical. So yeah, that's my that's my buyer beware. Is you know maybe maybe there's something culty about these these aphorisms that you kind of have to, you have to buy in first and then question. But if you start from a posture of disbelief you're also going to be correct but then you may not benefit from trying it on so there's a there's a danger to to the yes. jerusalem approach we will do and then we will understand um why don't you explain uh what you mean by the jerusalem approach i'm not sure everybody <laughs> has read leo's essay i know you you're right um well the Jerusalem approach doesn't have to be a religious one, but it just means that you need to immerse yourself in something before you have the ability to reason about it, as opposed to, to make a caricature, what we could call an Athens approach, which would assume that you can kind of start from a pure position and only accept those positions which accord with reason, as if reason is this pure instrument that doesn't have bias or culture or history or right or embodiment identity right that's good that's actually a great frame framing let's go into it um my my bias coming into this is that uh where i disagree with you is that wisdom is not ubiquitous it's just rare um, <laughs> uh that may, maybe that there's that uh, maybe what's ubiquitous about it is, you know, to quote Proverbs, wisdom calls in the streets, but nobody hears her voice, you know, very few people hear her voice. Um, so that there's wisdom to be learned almost everywhere, but like, you know, uh, very few people um, learn it, including uh, uh, even wise men, you know, are wise by exception, perhaps, if not by the rule. Um, that's my bias going into this. Um, you, uh, I don't know what you mean when you say wisdom is both <laughs> ubiquitous and rare. Um, yeah. uh, and I think, well, I think I, the, question, the question of Athens versus Jerusalem is sort of secondary to like what, you know, what does the statement even mean to you in the first place? 
for the sake of the exercise, I'll box myself into a definition. Um, notice I didn't say wise people are ubiquitous and rare or um, wise attributes or, you know, I said wisdom as I personified wisdom in a way. I, or I, I took this abstraction and I speak about it as if it's like this thing that exists independent of wise people or wise creatures. And um, I follow both the Greek and the Jewish and other traditions in that regard and that uh, wisdom is personified there. And that's important because it means that no individual has a monopoly on wisdom. It's like outside of us. It's a kind of transcendent feature, but we all are in relationship to it, whether or not we've actualized that or fulfilled that capacity. So what do I mean by wisdom? Um, I mean, one way to answer that is just to give a, a variety of synonyms. I think like insight into the human condition, uh, skill, um, existential skill and knowing what to do and how to be and how to relate to people. Um, I think, let's say, knowledge is knowledge about facts or even theoretical knowledge might be knowledge about how to organize those facts, but wisdom is the discernment about which facts to care about, which questions to ask, which not to. Um, it's, it's uh, I would say it's, an, it's the ability to prioritize what matters and to know why it matters. And also to be able to change your mind. And um, I know I'm all over the place, but I guess just the last point about wisdom, I would say AI can't have wisdom or be wise, at least as I understand AI, um, because um, it transcends the algorithmic. Like w wisdom is what taps into the the mystery of existence. Um, it's maybe something like self-knowledge or self-understanding. And so um, maybe it's, it's rare because even the most wise people will never fully have it and it's aspirational, but I think it's ubiquitous because implicitly people ex exhibit wisdom, even if they wouldn't know how to articulate the wisdom that they have. And I don't think wisdom is only to be found in human beings, but let's just stick to the human realm for now. You, you don't? Where, where <laughs> else do you think? It's is this found in nature. One conspiracy? No, I, I think that like, nature is incredibly wise in its ability to self-organize. I don't think that articulating that means I have to take a stand on like Darwinism or evolutionary theory and materialism. I think just the fact that like ecosystems exist and that entities within an ecosystem have incredibly complex symbiosis is, is deeply wise and there's much to learn from observing nature. But, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, does it make a <laughs> sound? You know, if nature is wise and nobody realizes that it's wise, is it wise? Well, so there's one part in which it's not because wisdom is a human construct. That the part, the part where wisdom is a human value or virtue or endeavor, clearly that doesn't apply to things independent of our projection. But to the extent that we evolved from nature um, and are part of nature and belong to a world that includes beings that are not human, are even what we call human is not so distinct from everything else. I'm, I'm open to the possibility that awareness is universally distributed um, beyond human beings. And since I think that, that wisdom is connected in some way to, to awareness, the fact that I might not be able to converse in an interesting way with a plant 
or an amoeba doesn't preclude the fact that it has some kind of awareness, but that's getting more speculative and perhaps less interesting for today's discussion. Um, so I don't, I don't think that wisdom equals having thoughts. That's another way of saying it. So the fact that something doesn't have language or doesn't have thoughts doesn't mean it's not wise. Language is how we communicate or manifest wisdom. Um, because of the, um, this is not a debate, it's an inquiry per se. You know, it's not a debate per se, it's an inquiry. Um, but um, it, it's either way, we're on tricky ground because it's like thinking about thinking or speaking about speaking. You know, we're very close to the, this singularity where it just loops around and um, it's hard to, to parse a concept like this because it's just connected to everything else. It's, very, it's a very abstract concept. Um, and so I, I could imagine a listener already, you know, being lost and we're at the, okay. beginning, of our, at the beginning of our conversation. And I don't think that's any fault of yours or mine. Uh, I just think, you know, it's kind of like quicksand here, you know, um, wisdom, what does it mean? Well, uh, you know, it's not thinking it's, you know, but it's involved with thinking it's, uh, um, it's, it, it's uh, not, not a, about the expression in language necessarily. It doesn't require language, but it's, it's involved in it. It can be personified, but it can be, um, uh, but it's not monopolized by any one individual. Um, uh, it has to do with epistemology, but it's not knowledge. It's, it's something else. It's about discernment, but it's mysterious. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it, it may or may not involve consciousness and it's just like what are we talking about um, you know what i mean uh, so how would you how would you ground ground the definition from a vague concept into something that it is um uh perhaps still vague because that might be unavoidable but as not vague as possible I think the best way to make this not vague is to say that wisdom is the, is knowing how to flourish. Is that vague? Is that still pretty vague? Um, and so knowing how to live a meaningful life, I think that, and, and when I say knowing how, I don't just mean you read a lot of self-help books and therefore you can write the best blog about it. I mean, the ability to embody it in each moment. And so you're constantly refining that because life is constantly throwing curveballs at you where the script that you have needs to be revised. And I think wisdom might also involve the ability to revise your script rather than having a top-down set of principles or values that you try to superimpose on your environment and therefore are not able to learn from it or transform yourself. Okay, so um, it's not the script, it's the embodiment. But then it, who's the evaluator? Who's the judge? And what's to say what, what script who's is to, using, you know? Who's to say what wise, what's wise and what isn't wise? Well, there you go. Well, if, if who's to say what's wise and what isn't wise, why is it a subject oh. of concern? Well, I, no, I was just mirroring you. Yes. Um, I wasn't affirming that. Yeah. Um, it, two things could be true simultaneously. One is that it's possible to be more or less wise and that there is some kind of judge or compass or w way to evaluate it. And it's also possible that we ourselves are not granted that evaluative tool. And so we have to do the best we can or use imperfect tools that are themselves subject to critique. Um, in other words, the question of how do you measure wisdom might itself be a question that we get better at answering the wiser we become. 
all, all of this. Oh, that's that's uh, that's very tricky, right? So okay, so <laughs> um, uh, the wiser. But you I, wait, wait, wait. I want to just I want to just fi finalize my point. I think in the last analysis, we ourselves, i.e., um, the in the the individual answers the question what is wisdom but i don't imagine the individual should be a totally unconstrained entity that is immune to feedback and inputs from other people i think it's also a collective endeavor because we have relationships that matter to us and we're grounded in history and community and we care about our legacy and all of these kinds of things. So I think that while the individual has the final word on the on what wisdom means to to him or her. Do they have um, the final word and it's entirely self-constructed? Well, I was just gonna say there's no there's no final word. But they have the final word on what what wisdom means to them. So that my well, just to finish the point about flourishing, I think, let's say Aristotle was one of the guys who popularized the idea that a good life is a life of flourishing. And um, I think the contribution of Heidegger and existentialist thinking is to say that in contrast to, um, in contrast to the ancients, there may not be a, a perfect script that works for everyone or works for rational man um, that tells us how to flourish. Instead, flourishing involves the ability to choose your life and not and not allow a pre-existing script about flourishing to direct it. If you end up accepting religion or ancient philosophy or whatever map you want to choose, it's still ultimately a choice. That's what makes us modern. And that's what that's the burden and the privilege of, of liberty, which is an enlightening value. So what, I don't know if wisdom is a trans historical thing, but for moderns and for us, wisdom is an existential, an existentialist endeavor rather than a, a game where everybody agrees on the rules. So that's that's what makes it perhaps more slippery today than in the past, right? I mean, the the, the Bible speaks of the Torah as wisdom. Proverbs talks about wisdom. Wisdom there seems to be just obedience to God, obedience to the law. Perhaps in communities where everyone knows what the law is and what's required, that's that's difficult. It's a difficult discipline, but it's not epistemologically difficult. But in an age of uncertainty even if you wanted to obey the law and submit to God, even if you wanted to do that, it might be very difficult to know what that means in the uncharted age of the internet and so many other technologies that just weren't around when these ancient texts were, were prescribing social interaction. And but couldn't you argue itself. that, that it was always slippery? So uh, when you read, <laughs> when you read Proverbs alongside yeah. Ecclesiastes, you realize, you know, Proverbs tries to portray wisdom as kind of, you know, um, don't do this, do this, and you'll be, you'll be well, you know, you'll be rewarded. And so wisdom is very much connected with flourishing in all senses, not just, a, you know, uh, a spiritual sense, but on an economic sense, a social sense, you know, uh, it's almost like harmonizing. It's very similar to the, the Taoist idea mm -hmm. of like coming into harmony with the community by not sleeping with your neighbor's wife, you know, this type of thing. Um, but then Ecclesiastes is, is um, uh, you know, saying, what's the fucking point of thinking or anything at all? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I don't think it's, you know, it's, it can't just be put on our social contract of liberty uh, and pluralism uh, that even, even pluralism effectively passes the buck to the individual but then the individual has to make the decision and then based on what, you know, ultimately somebody is, somebody is coming to this question, question of like, all right, fine, I'm responsible for deciding what wisdom is. How do I make this decision? How do I evaluate myself? How do I evaluate others? By what yardstick, by what standard do I judge 
my own progress or the progress of others, my own behavior, the behavior of others, my own decisions, the decisions of others. Yeah. It's a valid critique. And in this moment, I'm inclined to say, yeah, that just, that's tough. Like, I don't think wisdom necessarily can be subjected to a yardstick. I think wisdom is the meta problem of choosing what yardstick to use and asking why this yardstick. Like, it's very easy to come up with vanity metrics about one's scientific understanding or one's morality. I think wisdom is, it's very challenging in part because it's, 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 it's opening up a path of divergent thinking in many ways rather than convergent thinking. So rather than saying, this is the conclusive best way, it's, it, might be, it might just be the voice, like that Socratic gadfly voice that's saying, are you sure about that? What about this one? So, and I think, you know, you could say that wisdom is useless or even anti-useful if you, if you reduce it to divergent thinking. But I guess the reason why I think it's or useful or, or important for two reasons, one utilitarian, one maybe deontological or pure. Utilitarian, I just think we, we become deeper, better, more skilled people the more alternatives we can entertain, the more shut down and stuck in our ways we are, the less creative and flexible we are. Wisdom is the ability to get out of your, your patterns and, and see things from a different point of view. And then on like a, from a more purist point of view, I think that, um, science, by which I don't just mean empirical science, but I mean any endeavor that has a, a, a mechanism for solving problems. Problem solving doesn't get us, doesn't answer the question of why is this problem important? And so, and wisdom gets us to ask that question. Now you're saying, but wisdom doesn't answer that. So what's the point? I, I disagree. I think the, the point is to ask the question and then each person has to decide how they're going to answer that. But maybe the gift of wisdom is not settling on an answer, but at the same time, still having the confidence to act. But decide based on what, or even if you don't settle it, like, you know, act, act based on what? So this comes to embodiment. I mean, the best I could do might be like intuition. Um, and I, and, and I think that then, yeah, if you're an analytical type of person, you say, okay, like, can I develop my principles that explicate what's going on in my into it, my intuition and turn that into some kind of creed or religion, or in the case of Ray Dalio, like a, a philosophy of business or what have you. Um, that's fine. I guess the point of, of just emphasizing that wisdom is open-ended is to say, let's not, let's not get stuck in the idolatry of principles. Let's, let's remember that our principles are post hoc. They develop as a commentary on lived experience. They don't drive lived experience. Some people will insulate themselves from experience by only living through their principles. I, I can't say that's unwise, but for me, I don't, I, I wouldn't choose that. Um, in part because it just doesn't seem very fun, but maybe more politically it's harmful in some kind of way because it's reducing the complexity of the world to simplicity that if you follow the logic through ends up being totalitarian. I followed all that. Um... Let me play it back to you. Uh, in our social contract, we place the burden of decision on the individual. Um, but whether you were an ancient ruler like Solomon uh, or Hammurabi uh, um, or Moses, uh, um, or Pericles, 
um, or you were uh, uh, a, um, a modern uh, individual deciding for yourself, whether you were Diogenes or Socrates or whether it's Zohar or Francis, um, uh, either way, somebody's got to decide what wisdom means, both the framework for it, um, the script, as you put it, and the embodiment. And uh, um, reason is in some tension uh, with intuition and experience. A priori reason is in some tension with with um, post hoc uh, intuition and experience. Um, and, uh, you know, any principle you set up is really just a description of a pattern. And so ultimately can be broken by the, uh, the weirdness of reality. So any law that you set up, there's going to be some loophole or some way around it or, you know, um, and this, this actually leads right into, you know, a whole uh, tradition uh, from, uh, from say, you know, uh, Jeremiah to Jesus to Martin, to Socrates to Martin Luther, you know, of like uh, the whole, you know, criticizing the legalists, the dogmatists, the holier than thou people um, who have the law, but not the spirit of the law, say. Um, uh, so I think maybe that the right we could just call that formalism and and that does dovetail a bit into why I think wisdom is ubiquitous even though it's rare or why I see the ubiquity of of wisdom in working in partnership with its rarity rather than in conflict with it um because because life is so much weirder than reason can know in advance the more we throw ourselves into weirdness the more we meet people who don't see the world as we do and experience it differently from us and who conflict with our principles and our values, the, the more tested we are. Maybe we double down on our principles, but we're enriched by that encounter, I think. Um, and usually what happens is that you revise, you tweak, or you refine your understanding. And there's, there's a principle in, uh, in the Talmud that the Torah wasn't given to angels, it was given to humans. And angels are, you could say, they're like epistemologically perfect. They're also um, morally perfect in the sense that they don't have an evil inclination on the whole, but they also don't have bodies and they don't have mortality. And so wisdom, I Torah isn't given to them because wisdom exists for imperfect creatures who are able to work through or work on their imperfection in some way. Um, the way that the, uh, the Taoists solve this problem of defining wisdom and also the Hindus is they just say that, you know, that <laughs> there's literally like yeah. some ancient Sanskrit word. That's like that, you know, thatness, mm -hmm. thusness. Uh, Alan Watts has a great lecture called thusness. You know, um, because you, you can sort of talk uh, talk around it, but you can't really describe it. Um, and uh, literally, the word Tao is is way, but it's like the way the way that the word is used is um, the uh, the lacuna, the the uh, undescribable, unknowable thing. The, the first line of the Tao Te Ching is uh, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. Like, I'm going to try to talk to you about this thing that I can't talk to you about is sort of the, the whole premise of, of the, the tradition. Yeah. Um, so, but the problem is, you know, I hear, I hear, you know, we, uh, the practical people I know in life, uh, the business, yeah. the, the people who don't read philosophy and they read, you know, I don't know, uh, the mainstream media or something. And they like, uh, you know, the people who are um, sure. producers, producers in the world and, and make the world go around. Um, again, they're, 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 if they're with us so far in this discussion, uh, <laughs> a, I'm, a, I'm shocked. 
B, um, they're, they're even more confused than when they started because uh, we've, we've elaborated with even more detail and yeah. uh, we've described a set of relationships, but ultimately we've kind of failed, it seems, to come up with a, a, a definition for wisdom other than, I mean, other than the pursuit. It's all, the definition is sort of weirdly circular. It's like the pursuit of a flourishing life. Well, you know. Well, um, maybe, maybe if I had framed this as a commandment rather than as a description of how things are, that it would have resonated with the, the people of action. And we, we should have started there and say, well, what, what's, what's the, the practical import of this instead of, you know, what, how are you describing it? And I would say it's very simple. It's be humble. Be humble in two senses. One is um, think about how much better your life would be if you could learn something from every interaction. That's, that's kind of the, the self-criticism aspect of like get out of your own ego and your own principles and listen. But then it, there's also like the opposite idea, which is be, be humble and realize just how gifted you are, just how much wisdom you have. Like you alone have your experience. You alone have your understanding of your, of your domain, of, of what you care about, of what it's like to be you and share that and understand and understand that and take stock of that. Be grateful for that. Acknowledge that. You, if, if wisdom is ubiquitous, then you can't get wiser. That's the, that's the kind of the, the Eastern idea of like enlightenment is now, right? You, you're, you're perfect as you are. Everything has, has led you to this moment. The fact that wisdom is rare also means that you could do a lot better, uh, that you have so much more capacity for growth and that the good life is a life where you're realizing your unlimited potential rather than resting on your laurels. So we probably should have just started with that. Instead, we kind of did this metaphysical circular excursion trying to underwrite underwrite why that's the case. And perhaps from this little exercise, you see how important, how primary practices over, over thought, you know, what, what Marx and others call praxis is the um, in intellect, intellectual reflection that's embedded in a, in a sphere of actionable intent rather than just armchair speculation. But the, um, there seems to certainly be a difference, uh, a, big, a big historical debate here around um, how to be wise because the, yeah. the, Eastern, the Eastern approach is um, uh, more, say, convergent around a tradition. Um, and the Western approach is more divergent and creating more choices. And so you know, when it comes to action and thinking, the Eastern teaching is don't think, be, <laughs> uh, just breathe. Uh, don't be so anxious and don't, don't be always doing things and always building things and trying to get to some eschaton, some climax, some, some catharsis, you know, uh, just... Uh, maybe, just one quibble on that. Maybe, the, maybe that's, that's a Western import of the East because we are so self-dissatisfied with our own ambition or pseudo ambition that we needed some exotic culture to you know to become a, a, a placeholder for that, that that transcendental authority that can give us permission to like take time off and go on retreats by the way i think that's an excellent excellent point and definitely valid um because i don't think it captures the entirety of the eastern tradition at all it's more like the, what I just said is more like the way the West understands the East as opposed to what the East is. Yeah. But um, I, where I'm going with this is, um, does it's not just more action and more thought or higher quality action and higher quality thought or more 
and higher quality action and more higher quality thought, it's what is it exactly? It's not, is it about improving quality and quantity of action and thought or is it, or is wrestling else entirely? You're saying it's about on the one hand, I mean, if you want to, on the, your answer was on the one hand, being humble is about learning something, which means it's, it's a form of thinking and doing, uh, learn, 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 learn as much as you can. Um, uh, and so you can, the wise person, then I, I'm thinking about some neurotic learner. Um, uh, <laughs> wis wisdom makes you a nerd. Um, and then on the other hand, you're saying, well, you already have so much intuition and experience and reason and power and sort of truth within you. Um, and so this is a great responsibility for you to figure out what it's capable of. So then I, I hear like a neurotic doer and <laughs> so just hear like, you know, wisdom leading towards like a sort of an action and thought neurosis. I think a wise person is Okay, this is this is helpful, Francis. I think there's two ways to be wise that are in conflict with, with each other. One is, um, let's say, to be very metacognitively aware. So not only to be a doer, but to be able to get on the balcony and understand your motive, your true motivations. And I I think someone who's metacognitively aware, in a way. They, that could become deeply neurotic. And you see that kind of excess in a figure like David Foster Wallace or Hamlet, where the self-analysis becomes its own kind of drug and its own kind of escapism, and it becomes very cerebral and self-involved. But I also think that it can clear away a lot of the noise and the neurosis to be metacognitively aware as you sort of through what's other people's stuff that you've absorbed through like early childhood to the present and what's like in your heart, your heart of hearts. So that's like one kind of awareness, what, one kind of what wisdom, but then maybe the other kind of wisdom is the opposite of being metacognitively aware. It's being so immersed in what you're doing, like what the pop culture calls flow state that like you wouldn't even occur to you to explain why you're doing what you're doing because it's just so obvious. So I feel like metacognition is maybe something that develops from things not fitting together or not working. It's, it develops through crisis. And maybe the flow state is like everything's working perfectly. I think in a way, both of those are wise postures, but from where I stand, um, the metacognitive is, is better. I don't know if it's better, it's, it's deeper, it's, it's, um, it's more human. Because if you are incapable of experiencing crisis and things not working, then I think you're missing out on the range of human, human experience. And most likely you're going to get cracked and then you're not gonna be prepared. So I think, you know, med maybe metacognition is like the wisdom of old age and like flow state is the wisdom of youth. And maybe paradoxically, you want the, the young to be able to be metacognitive and you want the elderly um, to kind of access the childlike play and wonder that prevents them from just seeing everything through overly analytical uh, eyes. Again, yeah. like yeah. wonder is wonder. Wonder is, I mean, wisdom is naivete, and it's also maturity. I think it's it's mature naivete. Paul Ricoeur calls it second naivete. I don't quite agree with his definitions, but so it's not neurotic. That's that was my long-winded way of saying it's not neurotic. It's at risk of becoming neurotic, but you should be comfortable in your skin, and things are going to come up and. Life's gonna throw curveballs, but then wisdom is somehow like a, a, a faithful embrace of those, an affirmation of life. 
Um, I think you have to have a, I think you have to have a sense of purpose. You don't necessarily have to be able to articulate what your purpose is, but you, you, even a person who can't articulate what their purpose is might still have a sense of purpose. That's, that'd be their intuition. That's, that's the childlike, that's the childlike approach. You, what you're getting at being told in like two stories that seem to contradict. Um, and they're both sort of, uh, um, I'll frame it in the Buddhist tradition. Like, uh, you know, um, there's this idea of the hidden Buddha, you know, um, the Buddha could be anywhere, just waiting for you to realize that he's there. Um, and uh, so let's say the, 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 the Zen student can um, suddenly realize that uh, um, the old cleaning lady who washes his clothes, um, she's the enlightened one because she's in perfect flow state. She wakes up in the morning at the same time. She follows her rituals. She goes up the mountain. She gets the water. She comes back. She washes the clothes and she's content and she's not thinking and she's fully at one with the universe. And he suddenly has this realization and he sees her in a completely different way as like something full of peace and harmony and, and, uh, uh, and okay, that's story number one. Story number two is like the sequel where he walks up to the cleaning lady and he says, oh, enlightened one, teach me. <laughs> and the cleaning lady's like very, very confused, disturbed and bothered by this and starts asking him questions. And he starts asking her questions in the process. Like she becomes thoroughly confused and then starts, starts being taught by him about wisdom. And then she becomes, she develops this really, really great anxiety. Uh, and in part three, maybe the cleaning lady, uh, you know, is now, a Zen, is now a Zen student. And then she suddenly realizes that, uh, I don't know, uh, the cobbler, the cobbler's enlightened, you know, and it's just sort of endless. It's like the philosophy is this process of like, uh, uh, becoming disturbed and then becoming undisturbed or something by thought. Um, and, uh, and, um. You know, there's something very, very strange about both Jesus and Lao Tzu teaching us all to become like children. It's like, what? Um, you know, uh, how can enlightenment be reversion to infantilism? You know, what, what's going on? Um, can you explain? G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. G.K. Chesterton has an amazing image that I've, I'm fond of, um, he says, like for what, every time the sun rises in the morning, the child says, do it again, do it again. Mm -hmm. Or I, I, maybe I, I botched it. Just, just as every time a parent does something and the child says, do it again, do it again. So to God, each morning says to the sun, do it again, do it again. So whereas, <laughs> An adult has a law of diminishing returns. A child has like, what's the, like almost like a law of, what's the opposite of diminishing, like ascending returns. Like repetition for the average person is boring, but for like a wise person, they somehow find meaning or depth or novelty or something else even in, in repetition. There's always something to be gained. You don't have to go, you don't have to go seeking experience. So, so if there are these two archetypes, like the, you know, the child is enlightened and then Renoir's thinker is enlightened, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the king or like, you know, Atlas is enlightened, you know, the, the, the king with the furrowed brow with like the weight of the world in his shoulder, yeah. like, you know, the philosopher king archetype um, and then the like happy child who's just at one with the world, like how can these, you know, again, taking the, taking the skeptics position, this right. word that we're ascribing all this meaning to wisdom, it clearly is meaningless because two, <laughs> two such different things could not possibly describe the same phenomenon. There's a lot of different ways to answer that. I 
I mean, they're two different snapshots in a life. If you take, um, if you take a, a point of view where you're always wanting to see progress, then clearly the snapshot later on is the better one. Like to use an analogy from the business world, it's better to be um, an enterprise than a startup from the point of view of like an enterprise already has profit and revenue and like is making things happen. Whereas a startup has yet to, to prove itself. At the same time, like you talk to people who have been successful in enterprise about their favorite moments in business. And I assume any will say, maybe not, maybe I'm wrong about this, that they loved it when it was just them and someone else like in a garage or in a living room, like coming up with the idea and like bootstrapping. So, because when you're in the early phase, you have all this promise to look forward to that's unfulfilled and it's very exciting. When you're in the later phase, you know, maybe that's closer to death or complacency, retirement, um, you have all this wealth of experience, but maybe it's much harder to grow. Or okay, this to makes sense. exponential. Okay, got it. So you're, you're saying, okay, it's a paradox. So, you know, you can't just criticize it for being contradictory because I can show you many other paradoxes that are true and that we know are true. And so here's, you know, let's compare paradox A to paradox B. And I'm like, okay, okay. So <laughs> these things can, can be divided to two by twos, you know, say like, there's the best things about startups and the worst things about startups. And there's the best things about enterprises, <laughs> and the best things about enterprises. So it would be very unenlightened to have a startup that had the worst things about startups and the worst things about enterprises, say like a highly bureaucratic, <laughs> highly bureaucratic startup um, that burned money uh, like crazy. Um, and then, and then, you know, maybe there is some paradoxical ideal where it's like the enterprise that is as agile as a startup, or the startup that it has the same discipline and scale focus as like an enterprise. And like, you know, you, you want to be somewhere in that, you know, uh, the, the good side of the paradox, not the bad side. Um, and so maybe I think what you're getting at is that you want to be like the 70 year old like person who's like chiseled from, from the warfare of life, but who's nevertheless um, okay. still waking up every, every day to seize, to seize the day. As, as, as if a five-year-old, you know, who's going to go play in the fountain all day. Yeah. So exactly. So you, yeah. So, the, so in a way, did, <laughs> you don't want, you don't want the cynical kid. Had the ancients just not discovered the two by two and, and so therefore they, <laughs> fet, they just fetishized it. You know, um, I, I think that there's, uh, so let's think about some, some things that, you know, everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too, and calls that a paradox. So you could say, um, I want, I, uh, the, for example, the, the all, all the ladies who, who buy the, the face masks to keep their face, you know, fresh. And it's like, you know, um, is the old, is the line, um, uh, youth is wasted on the young and wealth is wasted on the old, right? So that's a two by two. It's like, well, you kind of want to be, you know, wealthy while you're young and young while you're old and a way to do that is um uh well i don't know make this crazy mad scramble for for wealth when you're young and then spend buy money on all the face masks and then when you're old you'll be you'll be young um and i don't i don't i don't subscribe to the, this analogy of the two by two when it comes to wisdom i think it's a it's a good approximation if you were trying to give someone like kind of rough and ready advice but I think of wisdom as not being goal oriented. It's, it's like, I guess that does mean I'm closer to this so-called Eastern approach, but, or, or to the childlike approach, maybe more than the maturity. I think that in so many areas of life, you're asking, how can I grow or get better? And I do think an important part of wisdom is like accepting things as they are accepting yourself as you are, accepting others as they are, and like treating the moment as perfect in a way. Even, even if you're dissatisfied, even if you're anxious, even if you're sad, whatever, then like on a meta level, it's like, okay, but is, there, is that a teacher also? Yeah, so you're saying that 
it's not teleological in the sense that it's not. It's not teleological. It's not something you. you the goal you, isn't to get. The, the goal, goal isn't to become wealth and young, wealthy and young. The goal. The goal is to be where you are completely and to enjoy the process. Well, no, you, what you're really saying, wisdom is, is the goal is not to be wealthy and young. The goal is to decide what the goal is. Um, and and uh, and so in that sense, it's, mm. ethos, it's ethos over telos. But really, that just leads to a different telos, which is that the, the wisest person, we can say that that we can say that some people are wiser <laughs> than others or even that somebody is the wisest um, because they're getting better in some dimension and the dimension that they're getting better in is deciding mm -hmm. what is meaningful and what is valuable based on what I don't know. Ultimately, it, it's not purely subjective. Uh, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't use words like wiser or wisest that it implies a kind of Aquinas, you know, sort of conformity of to like a higher law, basically that like there is some objective truth that God knows uh, about what is the most meaningful, valuable thing. And our job as mortals seeking wisdom is to conform our understanding of the world to his understanding. Um, and that's the Jerusalem approach. The Athens approach might be that there is such a thing as objective reality. It is knowable by reason. And our goal and our pursuit of wisdom is to conform our understanding to reality. Um, and that the wise person then, you know, uh, um, discovers what objective meaning and value are. I don't think, let me say this differently. There might be rules that are like the parameters for what distinguishes wisdom from unwisdom, but the most important moments are the moments of exception rather than the moments of conformity to the rule. Like, maybe for human beings as a whole, there are certain things you can say about what makes them wise. But what's interesting isn't what makes a human wise, it's what makes you or me wise. And the answer to that question isn't really going to be that enriched by taking, by taking some course or webinar that instructs you in like, these are the fundamentals yeah, of human wisdom. This is the great, you, might take that, uh, you might take that course and then decide what you're gonna do with it. But what, the only interesting thing is what you're gonna do with it. Okay. Um, so let's move to in our remaining minutes. Uh, so this is such a vast ground, obviously, like we could we could exhaust hours, but we don't have we don't have the leisure of the ancients, which is ironic. <laughs> With all of our technology, we should have way more leisure. But um, huh. uh, let's let's take whatever understanding of wisdom we've gained in the last, say, you know, 50 minutes, 56 minutes, and let's move our attention briefly to the question of uh, ubiquity and rareness. So convince me that it's not just rare, that it is also ubiquitous. I thought I, I, thought I had a little bit. Because one way, of, one way of doing it is is kind of easy. It's like ubiquitous in the sense that you can learn from dolphins and trees and children, and it's rare in the sense <laughs> that only rabbis have it, right? Something like that, you know. <laughs> or even it's rare in the sense that only rabbis who live in no, it's Latin it's ubiqu it's ubiquitous in the sense that you can learn from dolphins and rabbis. Yeah. And rare in the sense that just the fact that somebody has a credential or is in the wisdom industry doesn't at all mean that they have wisdom. It's poss It's quite possible that when I say rare, I mean, nobody has it in the Socratic sense of like, wisdom is this negative thing, kind of like negative theology. Like we can say what God isn't, we can say that we can say who doesn't have wisdom and um, or we can say where wisdom isn't or, and, and maybe, but that negativity is like a, a force field that can attract us to, to seek it in some way. I mean, this is, I think I, maybe it was Hegel or so, someone who's, one of the philosophers was focusing on the fact that the word philosophy means the love of wisdom and love means the attraction to, which implies in some sense, a lack of, like if, if you were wise, you wouldn't love wisdom because you would just have wisdom. Yeah. So maybe, though maybe, though maybe that's not true by my definition. And the more, the wiser you were, the more you would love wisdom because you wouldn't see it as this thing that, you either have or don't have, but rather that the more of it, 
you have, the more, the more aware you are of how much there is to pursue. The unnatural, so I don't, I, that, that too is natural, you know, um, there's this, yeah. uh, or, you know, the fool who persists in his folly will become wise. Um, mm. How could you, how, you know, if, can you even, can you even operate in the negative sense when it, when it comes to, to wisdom? Because tell me something mm. that is truly unwise that we can agree is unwise and then we then we'll know that what wisdom is. Um, but I think it's actually very difficult to even do that. Like, so do you believe that you can I point mean, that is clearly wise and we can all agree is wise, or clearly foolish we can all agree is foolish? I feel like when I whatever I would answer would it would be it'd be more accurate to say something that's irrational than unwise because i think that ir the irrational can still be wise like i was gonna say well it's it's not it's not wise to worry about things that you shouldn't worry about but maybe that's not true maybe there's wisdom in that experience i was i was also going to say maybe there's it's unwise uh, There's a principle in economics that you probably know much better than me, just about this, the trade-off between um, the present and the future. You know, you might call that like spending versus savings or um, taking one marshmallow now versus two tomorrow. How, how, much, how much should you put in your 401k versus like enjoying life now. And people have different answers to that so, sort of based on taste, based upon um, their situation. But maybe there's something in that also with regards to wisdom of like, how much are you living for today versus living for the future? Like, oh, I'm, I'd like to become wise in 20 years from now, but I don't need to be wise now. Or like, I just need to focus on being wise today. And like, I don't have any plan for what's going to be in 20 years. So if you extrapolate that out far enough, I think there's one impulse in religion to say this life doesn't matter. What matters is the next life, the next go around. It's like the ultimate investment strategy. It's like, um, and so they would say that anyone who buys into like the hedonic pleasures of this life which could include even being virtuous in this life in a way. Anyone who's like too bought into this life is, is spending and they're not saving and that's bad. Like they're going to have, they're not going to get the Rolls Royce in heaven. <laughs> and I think you have in a way the opposite point of view with secularism or atheism, which is like, well, there is no God. There's no go around. Like this is all we have. So yeah, I'm just gonna spend. Uh, austerity makes no sense. Spend money, Keynesianism. <laughs> and I can't settle those questions because those are questions of like belief in a way or temperament. But I, th um, I think both of those views in extreme are unwise. Like, I don't. I'm going to be agnostic about reincarnation or heaven or those kinds of things and still say that even if you are, even if you bracket those issues, it seems very short sighted to only focus on the now and it also, but it seems equally irresponsible to, to live your life hoping that there's going to be something better in the next one. So that's just a very long way winded way of saying, I think you need to affirm this life need to affirm this life. So anything that's life affirming is an affirming of your existence and celebrating of your existence is wise. Anything that is a diminishment of it, in my view, is unwise. And I think that if you're living for the virgins in, in heaven or whatever, that to me is very unwise, but it's probably unwise to think like, let's just, let's just live a listless life of pleasure and not have any concern for our life as a whole or our legacy. So I think 
you have to have some relationship to the meaning of your life as a whole, even though you never actually get to see the whole or, you know, not even a person who dies peacefully gets to really look back and watch a movie of their life and take it all in as a, as an integrated whole. So I, we are always get a partial you, view you think about the soldier who's going to land at the beach on D-Day. That person is not affirming their life. They're prepared to sacrifice it for, in a sense, something else. So, um, mm. is even that yeah. you know, a too slippery a definition? Well, if the person is choosing to sacrifice their life, then maybe that's that has integrity. If they're drafted against their will then maybe the wisdom has to be found in, okay, up here, what am I going to do about it? And how can I make meaning out of this? So there's always an element of constraint and an element of choice. I think wisdom is choosing the right things for the right reasons. But when it comes to things we don't choose, it's also choosing to see the beauty and the, the beauty in it and the insight in it, the, the something in it, the value, I don't know. Obviously not all of life's moments are equally fun or equally meaningful, but you don't know which ones are gonna pan out in the long run. So that again is like humility. Yeah. Something, that's, something that, that sucks while it's happening could end up being very powerful and fruitful later on. Um, so as a final question, uh, what did you yeah. learn from this, this conversation? I'll start with what I've learned. Um, I think I think you did an excellent job of navigating uh, a huge territory that is like full of booby traps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> truly, um, and um, uh, I'm struck with both the um, allure of wisdom, like please teach me. Like if there if there if there it was a way to know what to say, what to do, what to think at the right time, in the right ways, for the right reasons, to achieve the right outcomes, then that would create like tremendous serenity. Um, but in a sense, uh, we have this, uh, I, th I, think of, uh, I think of two things. I think of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, who says people don't want freedom. Freedom is such a burden. It's an existential burden. Um, you know, and, and why Jesus, why God did you create man? In your image with this burden uh, of sovereignty um, uh, where we have to make these decisions for ourselves without a clear standard um, you know why didn't you just tell us exactly what to do and make us slaves um, and I also think of uh, King Arthur's lament at the end of T.H. White's Once a Future King where he you know curses Merlin for teaching him how to think you know I spent my whole life trying to think about how to solve the world's problems <laughs> and I ended up with a broken kingdom um, and I don't know what the answer to the riddle is. Um, so, uh, you know, it's so alluring and yet so ev uh, uh, evasive or um, eluding. It's alluring and eluding. Uh, I'm pretty good. Um, and um, uh, and um, the uh, elusive and elusive nature of wisdom. So maybe that's my takeaway. You know, you say wisdom mm. is ubiquitous and rare. Like my <laughs> takeaway is that it is elusive uh, and elusive. Um, what's your <laughs> takeaway? Wow, so many. Um, for starters, I, I do appreciate you mentioning like the practical people who don't think philosophically listening to this and just reminding me to speak to an audience. I think um, even though this is being recording, I got very absorbed in just having a conversation with you, which just as a side meta point, like it's interesting to think about Socratic dialogues as having an audience, which obviously they did, like Plato dramatized them. They're not simply transcripts. And so people might say things differently knowing that someone's listening in versus if it's just one-on-one -on -one and I'm not sure it's like a meta point, but I'm not sure where I was in the spectrum between like just having a conversation with you versus having a conversation with some imagined possible audience. I think I got pretty drawn into having a one-on-one -on -one with you, which perhaps sacrificed the clarity and compassion needed to like 
speak to a non insider, but at the same time, sometimes like when you just dive in and ignore audience, you end up reaching them more effectively than yeah. when you try to pander to them. So I'll be curious to know how this is received. Um, this is the whole idea with the dialogues that somehow by just having a conversation, you reach like an insight or a breakthrough that you couldn't have yeah. planned. Um, this helps make explicit for me just how mushy wisdom is. And I agree completely with you. It's deeply alluring and deeply elusive. Um, for whatever reason, it's important to me. Like the word stands for something that I deeply care about, that I seek to pursue and cultivate, that I think of as one of my highest values and something that to the extent that I have that I feel joy and responsibility to share it with others. Um, and I try to live by what I said about it being ubiquitous and rare. And, but in terms of what the it is and what it does, I agree that those are, those are tough questions of accountability. And the best I can do um, now is similar to the best I could do at the beginning, which is like, you know, it when you see it, like, I, I can, I can make a list of like, these are the things I'm looking for in a, in a candidate I'm going to hire for the wisdom position. But like, I, I would know who to hire more, like, I would definitely have a hierarchy of of who I would hire and who I wouldn't hire. Yes, that's right. It's like, you know, um, it, it's a it's a miracle given how how confusing philosophy is that we can actually get anything done. <laughs> but it, <laughs> just the fact is that we do. We make decisions about who yeah. we trust, who we don't trust, who we think is wise, who we don't think is wise, and uh, and you can't. It is. It, it sort of. Uh, experientially undeniable that wisdom is exists and is important. So just like my last point on that would be in a way of this exercise is sort of asking you to step back and ask like, how would you code like a program for wisdom? Again, I'm not a coder, so um, maybe there's a reason for that as well. But, um, and what I'm saying is like, I actually can't write the code. I'm not sure if the code exists. Um, I suppose theoretically it, it should. But the fact that I can't write the code doesn't mean that like I'm not running the Zohar program that's already operating by this code. And whereas I think a rationalist would be very dissatisfied with that and would say that this is like hiding biases and self-interest and just it's too wishy-washy. I, I, I just disagree with that. I think that what it points to are the limits of rationalism and the importance of something else that per, that something else actually being precisely where wisdom is to be found. Rationalism. The, impo on, the, on the impoverishment of rationalism. Yeah, the, the rationalist would be on the same booby trapped uh, ground uh, if they tried to define reason. Um, thank you so much, Zohar. Uh, I love our conversations. I hope we have many more.